introduce um, one of the most um, distinguished of the CUNY graduates of the PhD program in philosophy at the Graduate Center. Uh, Bob Talese is now a professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University. And um, he is the author of many, many books, um, including Democracy and Moral Conflict from 2009, Pluralism and Liberal Politics from 2012. Uh, so it's really good to see a graduate who has done so well. Um, so hopefully that will provide some inspiration for you. Um, and we're having this in a kind of workshop format. So Bob is, um, we have made the paper available, but he will do um, a longish enough a statement of it, a summary of it, so that you'll be able to follow, and then we'll have an open discussion in a workshop format. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce Bob Talese, talking about epistemic democracy for the real world. Thanks. It's a real honor to be here. And um, So I know the paper's been distributed, but I'm just going to maybe talk for, definitely for no more than a half hour, just to um, uh, not uh, summarize the paper so much, although I will try to run through the, the central argument of the paper as to try to situate it in some broader uh, project that um, I've been working on. And I was just explaining uh, uh, to a new friend uh, that this is a, a line of thought that I've been trying to get right for um, uh, maybe a decade now, and I, 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 I keep trying to articulate uh, exactly what I think the, the role of epistemology, particularly social epistemology, is uh, for um, democratic theory. And um, I write it up, and uh, I put it out, and I get some pushback, and then I have to rethink. And so um, uh, I'm convinced in some way that um, democracy is um, a, uh, in part at least, um, an epistemological uh, proposal about society, um, and that there is some role that um, uh, epistemology, particularly understood as a social enterprise, um, should play in our understanding of what makes democracy worthwhile or what a democratic society should look like. And um, I keep experimenting with different ways of trying to get that thought off the ground, um, because uh, as I say at the very beginning of the paper, the very idea that democracy is in some way tied to an epistemic aim, like knowledge or truth or understanding or rationality, brings with it, that very thought brings with it um, a range of very familiar anti-democratic thoughts, right? Um, that is, one of the things that uh, maybe we first learn when we pick up uh, political philosophy, uh, either from reading Plato or Aristotle or somebody like this, is um, once you think that the name of the politics game is truth or wisdom, you are somewhere in the business or in the neighborhood of philosopher kingship, uh, some kind of elitism, um, because after all, on anybody's assessment, um, including, by the way, John Stuart Mill's tradition, right? On anybody's assessment, individuals aren't so good at knowing stuff, right? Um, and so if political authority or the state's legitimacy or the duty to obey the law, if any of these things is tied to truth or wisdom or understanding or rationality, it looks as if democracy is not going to be a particularly good mode of social organization. The thought here, then, is... Um, how to, or the problem, I should say, is how to make sense of what looks like the most promising thought uh, in the past 20, 25 years about democracy, that democracy isn't just voting, it's not just ranking preferences and counting heads, democracy might be involved in the, the project of counting votes up, but only after some communicative, deliberative, reason-sensitive uh, process, deliberation, or something else has happened. Uh, so. Once you go deliberativist about democracy, it looks as if you have to give some um, uh, analysis, theory, philosophical story about what deliberation is. It's hard to make sense of deliberation without saying epistemological sounding things. What's deliberation? It's weighing reasons. Well, what are reasons? <laughs> things that indicate the truth of things, right? Um, it's about rationality, right? So it's hard to make sense of deliberation as either the core of our democratic theory or as part of the democratic theory without sounding epistemological. Um, once you start sounding epistemological, the, the, the Platonists in the room, the elitists in the room start 
uh, getting very pleased with you um, because it looks like anti-democratic results will follow. So the task of the paper then is to figure out where to place the epistemic dimension of democracy. Is it that democracy makes the outcomes epistemically better? Is it that democracy makes our individual preferences more rational? People hold that view too. Is it that democracy makes for more rational communication between people? That's a kind of Habermasian style view. And you can think of all kinds of places where the, the epistemic action might be placed. Uh, it's one set of questions. Another set of questions is, um, when we're trying to make sense of the epistemic dimension of democracy, are we trying to tell a story about the obligation to obey the law even if you voted against it? <laughs> are we trying to tell a story about um, uh, the overall epistemic superiority to democracy as compared to other modes of social association and organization that we might cook up? Are we trying to tell a story about um, uh, the kinds of virtues that are required of individuals if they're going to be good democratic citizens. Is that an epistemic story? Um, so that's another, so there's the placement of the epistemic goods and then the sort of the point of telling an epistemic story of democracy. In this paper, I try to sort of bring those two together and say um, something that is a new answer to both questions. So let me start with the, the second. Um, when people, uh, as I say in the paper, um, start thinking about what we might very broadly call sort of a philosophical justification of democracy or a philosophical answer to the question of why we should be Democrats. Um, most often, in, uh, certainly in the tradition of political philosophy, um, but also most often in the contemporary literature, um, there's one or two particular understandings of that question that are being presumed. Um, perhaps most commonly when people ask um, for a philosophical justification of democracy, they're asking what I call in the paper um, the obedience question, right? What is the source of the duty to obey a law that's the product of democratic processes? Um, when may they be overridden? Um, and if you're a political theorist in some broad description, you're familiar, I'm sure, with all kinds of different ways to answer the question of the duty to obey democratically produced laws. Oftentimes these days, we tend to think that um, uh, democracy is unique in this way, that perhaps only democracy can produce collective decisions that even the people who oppose those decisions have an obligation to comply with. So that's the sort of obedience kind of question. Um, and that's one way to understand the question about how to justify democracy. I should notice, just for looking ahead, uh, the piece that you're reading from David Estland is largely a question about that, right? The David Estland version of epistemic democracy tries to give an epistemic answer to the question of what accounts for democratic authority, or perhaps a little bit more specifically, he tries to give an epistemic answer to the question of why is it that democratically produced outcomes have this moral force that binds us, even when we think they're mistaken or non-optimal or maybe even worse? Um, now, perhaps the most familiar um, way to approach the question of justifying or giving a philosophical justification of democracy is the, the, the query that you get in Plato uh, and in Aristotle. Right? The philosophical justification of democracy is a question about what kind of city should you make, right? Uh, this is what the Republic is about, right? What kind of city should we build if we're going to build a city? Um, and um, uh, that's a kind of question, by the way, that I think is uh, fairly prominent throughout the tradition of political philosophy. Um, uh, if we are going to have a city at all, what kind should it be? And um, you know, you get in the second treatise in law, a particular answer about why the city you should establish should be some kind of democratic city. Um, I think that those two queries, the obedience, why obey democratically produced laws, and the query, why establish a democracy when you could establish something else, I think those two queries are, are posterior to, or come after a different kind of query um, that philosophers should spend more time trying to address. Um, because, I think, it is the query that um, uh, we encounter uh, uh, first. 
Um, I should say as a side note, I have, if it's not already obvious, I have very strong pragmatist leanings in philosophy. And so this drives this thought that the political philosophical question that we confront is not, well, what city should we build if we don't already have one? And we, do we need a city? What should it be? That strikes me as a question that whatever value there is to that question, it comes, it comes a little bit later down the theoretical track. I also think that the question of, obe of obeying a democracy um, or obeying the law is, again, a philosophically sophisticated kind of question that comes a little bit later in the story, at least should. I think the first thing that we encounter, the problem that we encounter as citizens is, um, why keep your head in this game? Right? Why stick around? Right? Why keep being democratic? Right? Democracy, let's face it, makes lots of errors. However you want to understand errors, right? That your guy doesn't win the election all the time. Your, your uh, policy doesn't win all the time. The question is, wh why pursue democratic means of correcting right, uh, outcomes in these cases? Why not just um, defect from democracy altogether? So if we think of the question of obeying a democracy as one kind of way of understanding the philosophical justification of democracy, and we think of establishing democracy as another way of understanding the question of you know, how to philosophically justify democracy, I think there's a third kind of uh, query, which is what I call the sustaining democracy query. The query, you are already in it. Before you can even think political philosophical or political theoretic thoughts, you are already in a social world that already exists. You have connections to all kinds of other people. There are institutions in place that, let's face it, are really long-standing, really powerful, and really hard to change. So put all of that, presume all of that, put all that on the table. And sometimes your guy's not going to win or your policy is going to lose out. Why pursue democratic means of trying to correct that or trying to work with that rather than anti debt Why not just start assassinating people you don't like? Right? Why not? Um, so that question about sustaining democracy is a question of why pursue democratic means of changing democra or, or of correcting or, or changing the democratic system when it looks like it's gone wrong. Um, and so uh, one way of understanding that, and by the way, um, I also think uh, that um, it, it doesn't take a lot of um, uh, uh, looking at the world of popular politics, uh, not what goes on in universities, but what goes on in your table, uh, cable TV uh, news uh, uh, networks, um, to see and, and what's going on, I think, sort of a few blocks away, with uh, and somebody's holding up a sign of Barack Obama with a, a mustache that looks like Hitler's mustache out there. Um, it's a lot of rhetoric in the political, uh, public political discourse that is kind of insurrectionist. Right? That is um, uh, uh, teetering on the advocacy of uh, adopting non-democratic means for getting what groups want. Um, and uh, so this question of sort of when democracy is going wrong, what should you do, um, I think is a, is a question not just for philosophers. Um, now, in the paper, I sort of give this sort of taxonomy of very four kinds of, four rough responses to what one or what one and one's group or one's uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 fellows might do when democracy seems to be going wrong. And I try to say, you know, here are some anti-democratic responses, um, relocation and rebellion. It's a lot to be said about relocation, and I'm not going to get into why I think that that's a non-democratic response. Um, and then there are these democratic responses, right? Um, civil disobedience and petition, and the question is, or one way to understand or to reformulate the question of the, the sustaining democracy part, is say, you know, what reason can we as political theorists, democratic theorists, political philosophers give to citizens when their democracy has given them a result that doesn't only disappoint but seems wrong in some very important way to them, what reason can we give them to pursue the democratic means of response rather than non-democratic ones? What reason can we give to uh, not uh, start assassinating officials but instead uh, petition, uh, uh, um, build organizations, uh, write editorials, and perhaps uh, engage in civil disobedience. Now, um, philosophers who address this kind of question 
typically give a moral answer to that question. Why pursue democratic means of social change? For moral reasons, right? Uh, reciprocity. Uh, um, you need to respect the equality of your fellow citizens. Um, there's some, something morally good about a democratic society that's so much better than just getting what you want in this case. Um, now what I try to say in the paper is, that's probably a great response for 95% of the cases, right? But the really interesting, and where we should be trying to do work is the cases where somebody says, oh yeah, democracy is really, really valuable. But it's not as valuable as the value that's being violated by this democratic outcome. Democracy is not as important as, just to use one, hackneyed. But there's a reason why some examples become hackneyed. They're really good. But democracy is not as important as the protection of innocent human life, fetal life. Right? Imagine people saying that. You probably have heard people say this kind of thing, right? So it looks as if moral responses to this question will always sort of look like they're going to be begging the question against the person to whom they are addressed's sense of the rank ordering of the values, right? The person who is wondering whether to adopt a non-democratic response to a democratic <laughs> error looks like they're saying, look, the value that's being disrespected or violated in this case is more important than treating people as equals, is more important than democratic reciprocity, is more important than the values associated with democracy, which might be very great values indeed. Uh, as I have in the footnote there, John Rawls takes this up. And there's a footnote in political liberalism where he just says, we're just assuming that the values associated with democracy normally will outweigh any other values. I think that that's a perfectly fine assumption. I also think, well, yeah, but philosophy's got to talk to the hard cases too. Right? You can't make all the cases the easy ones. Right? Okay. Then here's the strategy. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, epistemology uh, is a normative enterprise and a normative field. I think that when we're doing epistemology, although there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about fake barn facades and uh, white balls with red light shining on them, uh, and this, um, you know, Jones knows that somebody owns a Ford and this kind of thing. Um, that is a very active part of the field of epistemology and it's easy to get the impression that that's what epistemologists do. Um, but um, that's not all epistemologists do. Maybe there's something to be said about uh, how often epistemologists get uh, tied up in problems with uh, fake barns and the rest and that they should be doing more uh, normative work in epistemology. But um, I think epistemology is um, about a certain kind of behavior, um, and it's a behavior that is accessible in normative terms. I think that um, epistemology is the study of the way that we go about not only forming beliefs, but also maintaining them. Um, and I think that there are distinctive ways in which um, uh, epistemic behavior can be criticizable and commendable. Um, so uh, I am a, uh, a social epistemologist with a very distinctive normative, or what's sometimes called ethics of belief, uh, bent. Um, so I think that um, there are distinctive um, epistemic normative categories or norms um, that have interesting relations, perhaps, that have, I don't try to spell them out here, I have views about this, have interesting relations with more familiar moral norms. Uh, and social norms, but uh, there, there's a normative edge uh, to epistemology. We can be uh, admirable and criticizable qua believers, right? Qua inquirers, qua asserters, qua reasoners. And what this paper and this general project is trying to do, and is trying to bring into the conversation of democratic theory, is some recognition that there is a category of normativity that's distinct from the moral category, right? Maybe at the end of the day, not all that distinct, but at least in the first pass, distinct um, or distinguishable, and that these epistemic norms um, uh, might in certain instances be less reasonably contestable than some of the moral norms we have to appeal to when we're talking about democracy. One way to put this, just to, so, you know, it, it's still the case that everybody has to position themselves relative to walls, um, for better or worse. Um, if you think of the problematic in John Rawls's second book, right, the, the political liberalism book, um, which is the sort of like, how do you give a, a, a good account of 
um, the value of a liberal constitutional political order when you know that there's reasonable moral pluralism, right? There's a plurality of reasonable comprehensive doctrines. Looks like you can't tell the story about liberal democracy in the vocabulary of one of those doctrines because there are other reasonable people who that story is going to alienate, right? By the way, I happen to think, just side note, think that that's what Rawls will be remembered for. Is that problematic? I don't think people are going to care about the difference principle before too long. Um, but I think that the problematic is something important, and it's a problem for liberal theory, and Rawls put his finger on it, I think, better than anybody. Um, one way to read this project, then, or this sort of line of thought is, yeah, there's a fact of reasonable pluralism about comprehensive moral doctrines. Yes! I don't think there's a fact of reasonable pluralism about the most fundamental epistemic norms. That's the claim. Um, now the thought is, how do, you make, how do you make good on that? How do you try to show that the kind of universalist moral stories that political philosophers of various stripes prior to Rawls have been trying to tell about liberal democracy, all those stories fail because of this uh, moral pluralism of comprehensive doctrines. How do you say that the epistemic stuff is not as morally controversial? Um, here's how it goes, right? So um, there is uh, something in philosophy um, uh, that has nothing to do with political philosophy called Moore's Paradox, right? Um, I don't know whether, when I was a graduate student here at the Grad Center, there were actual courses taught on Moore's Paradox. I don't know if this is still the case in the philosophy department. Um, but anyway, Moore's Paradox is just... Uh, it's not even clear what, in what sense it's paradoxical. Just the strangeness of the following thought, understood as a first personal thought, a thought that you have about some other belief, some belief that you have. Say, let's call that belief P. Imagine yourself believing that P and then having a second order assessment, another belief, let's, a meta belief about your belief in P. I believe that P, but P is false. Right? Now it looks as if it's somehow kind of part of what a belief should be is not false, right? I believe that it's raining, but it's not raining. I believe it's January, but it's not January. These are thoughts. These are first personal epistemic assessments that once you have them in your own case, it's like the epistemic equivalent of slipping on a banana peel, right? It's like, I believe that it's January, but it's not January. That's typically enough to get the belief to go away. Right? To recognize the falsity of P is typically enough to dissolve the belief that P. Right? Now, philosophers think that there's all kinds of interesting lessons to be drawn from that about the psychology of belief, maybe about the ways in which uh, our conception of truth has to hook up to other kinds of notions. I think it's a, it's, it's, there's a normative thought to be had about that. Right? You can express this in all kinds of ways. It's typically the case that people say things like, beliefs are truth aspiring. I don't like to sort of talk about beliefs as having their own intentions. So like, when we believe, we aspire. We are aiming at believing what's true. Or to put it slightly more weakly, right? When we have a belief, we are aiming to not believe the false. Right? That would be another way of putting it. Now, um, the Moore's Paradox thought looks to me like, yeah, when, when you discover that one of your beliefs is false, you should stop believing it. Now notice, by the way, we don't always stop believing P when we find it's false. There are lots of convenient, right, um, uh, 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 um, alternatives. Uh, you can deceive yourself. You can go cherry pick the evidence. You can delude, right? You can go find people who agree with you and get them to keep telling you that you're right. You can do all kinds of maneuvers to preserve a belief after you've come to see that it's false. You can figure out ways to get you to forget that your belief is false. But notice <laughs> that those machinations are necessary. Confirms the thought, right? That's, that that self-deception is necessary in these cases is not because, well, we have no problem believing what's false. It's, you have to deceive yourself because you've got a problem with this assessment that the belief is false. You've got to figure out a way to get yourself to stop paying attention to that fact. Okay. So the thought is that beliefs aim at truth or that we aim at truth when we have beliefs. And uh, I think that the argument then, and I, I hope it's clear in the paper, the argument then sort of says, look, that's a very, very strong norm of belief, truth aspiration. Um, 
And then I try to say, look, there are weaker norms that are kind of, once you are in the business of aspiring to have true beliefs, there are weaker norms that sort of come along in the package, right? So, and what I try to do in the paper is to say, look, let's start thinking about epistemology uh, from this point of view of a first personal assessment of one's own beliefs. Let's forget about fake barns and uh, uh, you know bent sticks and water and all that stuff. Say, so let's just look at first personal assessments of beliefs. Doesn't even matter what the content is. They don't have to be moral beliefs. They can be beliefs about what's you know how many dollars are in my wallet, right? It's like okay, I believe I have five dollars, but it's not true that I have five dollars. That looks like it's enough to get the belief to to to, to uh, dissolve the belief, right? Now, what about an assessment like the following? I believe that P, but all my evidence counts against it, right? I believe I have five dollars in my pocket, but every time I count the, a number of dollars in my pocket, it comes to something less than five. It's like, well, that also looks, maybe it's not enough to dissolve the belief, but it is enough to say, look, there's something amiss here. Epistemically, things are not right, or things are not all as they should be, right? That is, looks like hot on the heels of the truth aspirational norm is a norm in the paper that I call the sort of evidence tracking norm. Not only do your beliefs have to be accessible as true, they have to be accessible as sort of corresponding or tracking the evidence you have. And when it looks as if you have a belief that's not jiving in the right way with the evidence, you might still hold on to the belief, but it looks like there's something about the belief that's not as it should be. Um, I think that similarly, um, if you think of the as I have in the paper, the third, I believe that P, but my evidence favors neither P nor not P. Um, that is, if it looks as if the belief isn't responsive in the right way to the evidence, right? So the first norm is the truth aspiration, the second norm is uh, this sort of, evi this sort of um, uh, evidence tracking norm. If you think that the belief isn't responsive in the right way, to your evidence. That also looks like there's something amiss with the belief. Something needs to be done to rectify that. Now, I think that um, uh, it's hard uh, to think of cases where these three norms can be just disregarded and that we can see the person or see ourselves as actually having beliefs. I think that if somebody goes around violating these norms, I believe all kinds of things that are false, right? I believe all kinds of things for no evidence. Or I believe all kinds of things and the evidence counts against them. I think that if people walk around really asserting those things, we take them to be joking or insincere or being philosophers in a bad way or, you know, children who haven't mastered the vocabulary uh, that we use when talking about ourselves and our uh, doxastic lives, if it can be put that way. So I think that those three norms it's sort of really hard to contest, really hard to dispute. The trick now is, the rabbit out of the hat thing, is to try to show, yeah, once you admit that much about first personal epistemic assessments, I think we can start pulling along, right, bringing into the picture, in a weaker sense to be sure, but nonetheless, right, in, a, in an important enough sense, strong enough sense, social epistemic norms. Right? What has to be true of the cognitive environment under which I'm forming and revising and maintaining my beliefs such that I can see them as an epistemic, I can see them as passing a, 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 a um, requirement for epistemic good standing. And so um, I've got these sort of social epistemic norms that are dialectical and institutional. Just run through them really quickly. I, mean, I don't know whether any of this was, was actually convincing to any of you. But um, imagine somebody saying, I believe the P, but I've never consulted any of those who deny the P, and I have no idea why they reject it. Right? Or, I believe the P, but whenever I engage with people who reject P, I lose the argument. I can't win arguments with people who disagree with me. Right? I always get, I, I, I always lose the argument. Right? Now, imagine somebody sort of assessing one's belief in that way, right? That look, or rather, better, imagine yourself having that assessment. That is clearly not good epistemic news. That's bad epistemic news, for sure. It looks as if a certain degree of what I call dialectical success, right, comes along with, right? That's a norm that comes along with holding a belief. 
You believe that pain not only does it have to be true and have the right hook up in these two different ways with your reasons, you also have to be able in some way to account for pain, right? In some way to hold your own against criticisms, right? Um, that's what I call the sort of dialectical social epistemic norms. That is, imagine these other epistemic norms, right? These institutional social epistemic norms. I believe that P, but all my evidence against P has been suppressed, right? Imagine yourself in, 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 in Winston's position in, in 1984, right? I have these beliefs, but I know that all of my, all, all critics, right? If you're a critic of P, you get hauled away in, in the night, right? All the newspapers are vetted to make sure that P is always the outcome, right? It's always supported. Like once you start thinking that, well, gee, I have these beliefs, but as a matter of the social epistemic institutional environment, everything is rigged to get me to have that belief. That has to look like, well, maybe I shouldn't trust, I shouldn't trust my belief anymore. That has to look like something needs to be, something's up. Something needs to be done about the belief. Um, uh, I believe that people, all my information has been vetted by the minister of truth. Um, you might still have the belief, but it looks as if the belief is in some way defective. Um, so it looks to me then, and I'm, I'm, I'm fin wrapping up really quickly, it looks to me then that we've got these sort of first personal norms about evidence and truth. Hot on the heels of those norms are these sort of social epistemic norms, like what we might think of as sort of the call pop or like open society norms, right? If you're going to be an inquirer, right, you have to be able to say like, yeah, well, you know, people are free to go and run the tests. People, if somebody had a good objection to my view, to, to P, right, to my belief, they would be able to tell me about it if I asked them. They wouldn't be too scared, right, of, of being in prison for criticizing P. Right? So it looks like there are certain kinds of open society, maybe we might think of them broadly as million norms that have to be in place, and here's the important part, if you're going to be able to see your belief as satisfying those first three first personal norms. That's the thing, right? If you see that your epistemic environment is systematically distorted in ways that violate these dialectical and institutional social epistemic norms, you can't see the belief as having the right relation to the evidence because the evidence is all messed up, right? Um, deliberately all messed up uh, and controlled. Now, of course, it's not the case, or is it, we should of course say that, yeah, a million society is not necessarily a democratic society, right? The Popperian open society is not necessarily democratic. Nothing in the story yet talks about anything having to do with democracy. Fine, that's why I've got this other set of Right? Um, I think democracy comes into the story once you realize that in order to see your beliefs as, in order to see your doxastic environment, right, as um, socially epistemically sound, you need to also be able to see that environment as um, the kind of thing that you can critique, the kind of thing that you could work to change, the kind of thing that whatever the institutions are that are responsible for sustaining and creating it, can be held accountable when things go wrong, right? So the, uh, the last two norms, I believe that I'm functioning within a well-ordered social epistemic system, that is a, a social epistemic system that's going to enable you to see your beliefs as satisfying the four social epistemic norms, but I have no reason to believe that, right? There's no, I, there, there'd be no way to investigate, right, how accurate the newspapers are, right? Or, I believe that I'm functioning within a well-ordered social epistemic system, but if I should come to find that it's systematically corrupt in some way, there's nothing that nobody, I couldn't appeal to anybody. Like, if you see that there would be no way to correct or hold accountable or call to account this, the people who are responsible for the institutions that disseminate information and that communicate results and all the rest. There's no way to investigate or scrutinize or interrogate or hold them accountable. You have to think the whole thing is somehow, possibly at least, rigged. And then it looks like, again, you're going to fail to be, you're not going to be able to see your beliefs as satisfying norms two and three, the, 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 first, the, the second and third first, and, uh, first personal norms. So it looks as if then, and here's the rabbit out of the hat, I admit, right? Looks as if from these highly, sort of barely controversial first personal norms, 
Belief should be true. Belief should track the evidence. They should be responsive to the evidence. Hard to, hard to deny any of that. It looks as if you can fairly, it seems to me fairly easily just to get a set of epistemic norms of broader kinds into, again, social epistemic norms and ultimately democratic norms that aren't saying with other epistemic Democrats that the correctness of, dem the likely correctness of democratic outcomes is what's important about them or what's important about democratic authority or Esklund's view, for example, is that Democracy is epistemically best of all of the morally permissible forms of social association. That's why you get authoritative outcomes from it. I'm not interested in the outcomes of democratic processes. Well, I am, just not in this part of the story. In this part of the story, I'm just trying to say, look, why should we be invested in, very broadly speaking, a democratic society? I think that's a question that comes first. Now we're going to have to tell stories about the duty to obey the law. We're going to have to tell stories about why democracy is superior to other kinds of forms of social. I think you still get to have, you still have to do all the other work of democratic theory. I think the first problem, though, the first thing, you have, what is why are we interested in thinking about this kind of society at all? Why should we be at least provisional? committed to this form of social association? The answer I'm trying to, to make a case for in this paper and a lot of other stuff I've done um, is because you need a democratic society in order to see yourself as having the right, as a cognitive, doxastic, epistemic agent, right? You need a democratic society in order to sort of have the right relation to your own thoughts, right? That's the way the argument runs. Um, and so, again, it's a rabbit out of a hat in the following sense. It looks like a gigantic conclusion following out of something that is really sort of hard to deny, right? That's, that's the sort of the virtue muscle. You start with uh, uh, premises no one can deny, and you get a conclusion no one can believe. Uh, I hope it's not exactly that, but it does have that flavor of trying to get a whole lot out of something pretty minimal. Um, and um, I would be happy to hear what anybody has to say about that. Thank you. Aaron Bentley. Um, so I wonder if you might run into some trouble um, getting from your second uh, claim about individual uh, rational stuff. So uh, beliefs have to uh, kind of track with my evidence, uh, and then getting these kind of more specific social epistemic claims. Uh, and I wonder if the problem you run into is uh, the notion of my evidence isn't going to necessarily be consistent across people, right? right? Um, so I think that, for example, uh, if you are uh, a very devout Catholic, my evidence is going to be, what does the Pope say, right? Uh, and if my evidence is, what does the Pope say, then the sorts of social norms or social epistemic norms I'm going to get out are not going to be the sort that lead you towards democracy, right? They're going to be leading you towards theocracy of some kind, I would presume. Uh, well, it some, depends on what the yeah. Pope says. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's true. But they, they <laughs> could in principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this Pope might not be yeah. the best case for your side. But, yes. uh, yeah. but uh, I see the point. Uh, and so you're, you're either stuck with something where, you know, you've got some variation in what my evidence means, and so you have variation in the kind of political outcome you're going to get. Or you're stuck saying, well, we can say uh, the sorts of evidence, we can, we can kind of talk about the sorts of evidential relations that are the good ones, the ones that are the bad ones. But then we have a different sort of uh, epistocracy, right? We've just, instead of political philosophers, we have epistemologists and logicians and things like that running things instead of political philosophers. So I wonder if there's kind of a way out of that sort of a... Sure. Um, Heaven forfend. So there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on there, so thanks. Um, uh, I will say this. Um, uh, it is a rare occasion on which I give a talk about this where the first question isn't about religious believers. Mm -hmm. So you are the, the most recent in a long line of, yeah. uh, of folks who raise this concern. But not as well. Is it? That's exactly right. So you're, 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 you're thinking the thoughts that the people at Princeton were thinking and the people at all kinds of other places. So good. Um, let me say one very quick thing about this about, about this sort of the, the worry about religious believers, right? Um, and um, in, in 
raising the particular example of the Catholics, I don't think you've made the case as well as you might have, because remember, um, you know, the interesting thing, I'm not a religious believer myself, but in dealing with this kind of objection, I've come to learn a lot about uh, uh, what people say about different kinds of uh, um, uh, sects of Christianity. Um, the Catholics, um, even though they think the Pope has this special kind of authority, um, still think the Pope has to demonstrate the reasons for the pronouncements, right? So I don't think the Catholic is a very good example of this. And I think the, the, the Catholic in this case, or the, the kind of authority the Pope is supposed to have, according to Catholic uh, 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 believers, is very, very interesting because he does have to, right, the authority comes from reason, right? I think you'd be much better off, and the, the, uh, the argument uh, of this kind that's usually used is um, sometimes fundamentalist, whatever that means, Christians, right? Or, you know, literalist Christians, right? Now, um, again, I think there's a, there's a story here to be told uh, about exactly who we might be thinking about and whether the thoughts that we're having about those people um, uh, reflect prejudices that we might have, right? Um, and I think it's interesting uh, in thinking about religious believers, uh, uh, even of the kind that would be this sort of, you know, the kind who have bumper stickers on the back of their car, like they, the one I saw this morning in New Jersey, said the Bible said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Um, uh, about whether these communities are as epistemically um, so far removed as we like to think they are, right? Um, certainly with respect to certain kinds of matters of their religion, they seem to be, right? I don't know whether they're, they're are, they are epistemically so different from us in their political, I mean, the content of the political beliefs for, for sure, but what they think has to be true of those beliefs epistemically, or as far as the justificatory story goes, I don't know, I don't know that they're less inclined to try to appeal to reasons and, and data. Um, and if you go and look, by the way, as I would recommend doing. It's very, very interesting stuff. Go look at the radical, right, religiously driven um, uh, uh, material about gay marriage, for example, right, the abomination literature, right, uh, or about abortion, right? What's really interesting, right, is that you'll get the, you'll get the citing of the texts, for sure. But there's always going to be a story about the importance of the family, the way that they, this destroys children. There's always going to be an appeal to data, stuff that you would recognize as data in the non-success. It's an attempt to, set, to cite evidence. You might wonder about whether it really is evidence. Now, you're right that there are going to be um, different conceptions of what constitutes evidence, different conceptions of when something counts as evidence for a claim and when it doesn't. That's fine, but notice, I'm willing to say, yeah, good. That we think we need to tell a story about, right? Why that pronouncing, why, why that pronouncement from some particular figure counts as evidence, right? Um, religious believers will tell you why they think it's evidence. You can engage with them on that. That's not just so, here's a one way to, here's one way to sort of encapsulate the thought. Um, I think it's a caricature of religious believers to say that their epistemic method is authority all the way down. There are authoritative elements of it, right? But I don't know, I have yet to encounter a religious believer who says, um, I believe what that guy says. Why? Because he's the authority. Why is he, why is he the authority? Because he says he is. They're always going to be willing to tell you a story about why that guy's the authority which you can then sort of, they're in the game of giving and taking reasons, just like you are at that point. Um, so the religious believer is an interesting case, but not, I, I, I don't think they're epistemically alien in the way that we I might like to think. Follow but, up. Yeah. So I'm, but I'm not sure if you need the distinction between, uh, say, truly authoritative uh, norms of evidence and non-authoritative norms of evidence. Um, I think, all you need is the fact, this kind of simpler fact that you've already acknowledged, that there are going to be uh, different norms of evidence accepted. And some of those norms may not uh, necessarily involve 
say, dialectical interaction uh, of some okay. sort, right? And I think if you get that far, you're going to have some people who are considered better judges of this and some who aren't. And then you're going to at least have some sort of weak. Uh, kind of, and so that's a conceptual possibility, yeah. right? Um, I am worried about the caricature yeah. issue. Yeah, no, um, certainly. I and I think that um, religious believers who have standards of evidence of this kind either make two, one of two, one or maybe both of these two moves. The standards of evidence are quarantined in the following sense. They've got a set of standards of evidence for their decidedly theological commitments. Mm -hmm. That's a special pleading kind of argument. And they, they do the same thing you do when your car doesn't start in the morning. They go and look under the hood mm -hmm. and they look for evidence of the kind that you would recognize as evidence, just not with this special class of belief. Or they've got a more thoroughgoing conception of evidence that um, uh, plays a broader role in a range of beliefs that go beyond just their theological commitments. But they are willing to say why those are the right evidential standards. And that's not just repeat, that's not just repeating the evidential standards. They're going to try to give you a story that you can recognize as an argument for their evidential standards. That's what Plantinga's work is. <laughs> Right? And it's important that that's what it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Some more people and Jules. Well, I guess this is a follow up. I mean, you, you probably already answered the, the question I was going to ask. But I feel like there's some sort of tension between, uh, well, in, in the test that you set yourself to. Uh, so, focusing on the moral fight, which is quite, well, you seem to be saying that it's quite tragic you know, to a certain extent at the moment. And uh, on the other hand, trying to provide a truth-centric remedy um, for these moral fights. It seems that while well, you've already solved the issue of this moral fight, if you get people to already um, agree to some normative um, epistemology to some extent. Okay, so good. So this is usually the second question, right? Why, is, why are these epistemic norms different from the moral ones? Don't you just get the same problem, right? And here's, again, here's why I don't think so. Um, because I think that at, at least the first three norms, right, are, to use a philosopher's term, internal to the very phenomenon of belief itself. I haven't, I'm not trying to convince you of these norms. I'm trying to show you that you already accept them as a doxastic agent. You already see your beliefs as bound to them. That's what, so it's a, um, uh, depending on which philosopher you more resonate with, I'll say it's a Hegelian thought and a Robert Brandom-esque thought. Maybe those aren't two different kinds of thoughts, right? It's the showing you something that's already implicit in what you do, that once you see it, you say, oh yeah, of course, I couldn't do it any other way. That's not an argument for saying this is how you should do it. It's actually an argument to become more aware of what's already implicit in what you do. So I think that for this kind of thought to work, somebody's got to show me that the Moore's paradox thought isn't, isn't paradoxical. There's nothing wrong with saying, I believe that P and it's not true. So what? Nobody wants to say that. At least nobody I've encountered yet. We have some more. Um, um, first. Yeah, so maybe the, the paragraph that I go to is 15. Um, in, order to assess, <clears throat> in order to assess ourselves as having proper beliefs, we must be able to assess ourselves as functioning within a cognitive environment that is at least not systematically distorted. Accordingly, for the first personal epistemic norms entail, etc. things. And it just seems that you're placing so much weight on ourselves as a gen, or what is it, uh, doxaxic? Doxastic. Doxaxic beings, cognitive beings, beings who are consumed about approaching nearer to the truth. And I mean, I think that's, you know, we're, we're professors and we live this stuff, but I'm not sure, but even then, I'm not sure how much of my life, how much of my commitments are based upon that element of my being, and then in the and then in the wider world. So anyhow, why why are you emphasizing putting okay. so much weight on that? Great, that? and that wasn't the third question. No, no, no. But this is, the, you know, you, you, I'm sure Carol knows this. Too. You give enough of these of talks about the same stuff, you get familiar with I the. I have one that hasn't been asked. Okay, great. Um, so, um, good. So does Josh. We, uh, we're, we're philosophers, we like to think about these things, isn't this an overly intellectualized conception of what individuals are like and, and all the rest. Um, no. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so um, here's a really interesting fact, I think, about um, uh, maybe where one would look to find the other end of the spectrum. As far as you can get from the ivory tower, right? Fox News, right? But, but, I don't know. But I don't Popular know. discussions of politics, right? And I'm, gonna, I'm going to rattle off the titles of some of these books of the people who you would never read. Liberalism is a mental disorder. If Democrats had brains, they'd be Republicans. The Republican noise machine. The no-spin zone. Go look in the Barnes & Noble at what is probably presented there as the political science section, which is not political science. It's just you know bad books about you know, popular political commentary. It's all epistemic. Every one of these images is an epistemic image. We report, you decide, is appealing to an epistemic norm. Isn't that right? a reputation of your view? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to run it the other way. I'm going to run it the other way. <laughs> These are slogans. They are functioning merely as slogans, right? The no spin zone is where all the spin happens, right? Why are these so predominant as slogans? Because they resonate. Because we like to think of our political beliefs. Yeah, I'm the one who's not falling for the spin. I'm the one who's not the one who doesn't. I don't, I've got brains. I'm not a lying liar. I'm not falling for a noise machine, right? So I think that these epistemic images are actually pervasive. And um, I don't think it's hard. Uh, and by the way, it's also, uh, uh, um, you know, one wonders. This, by the way, is something I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight at, at the session on Carol's work. Uh, one wonders why there's so much pantomime of debate in our news programming. Mm -hmm. It's because we demand it. We demand to see our side argumentatively defeat the liberal or the conservative or whoever it is who's on the other side. We need to see that, right? I think that that is a telling uh, feature of our cognitive lives, how important that is to us. Oh. Now, it gets violated and, and misused and manipulated, but that is so pervasive shows it's because there's something really deep here. That's the way I would run it. Yeah. Yeah. Josh. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good to see you. Yeah. Um, so I guess my concern isn't so much with this, like, I guess what you call the hat, like these epistemic norms that we all share. It's when the rabbit gets pulled out, like, um, I just worry, it seems like we're getting a lot out of these base epistemic norms, and I think a couple of people have touched on points maybe that, that, that I worry about, which is that people's epistemic standards with respect to evidence differ a lot. Like, I mean, we all know that person who doubts everything, probably most of us in this room, or that person among the friends that they know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that seems like a real problem to me, that then you're gonna get this, you know, these democratic institutions out of it. And then the second problem is, I'm not exactly sure I understand why these institutions are necessarily democratic. Um, it seems like they could sort of be instituted in any number of different systems. I mean, it's certainly like, you know, a beneficent uh, tyrant, you know, who's willing to listen to people who does, you know, if you sort of want to frame it in Rawlsian terms, what's the, a decent hierarchical society? Right, where there is reason giving and taking sort of between the lower level and the higher level seems like it could definitely satisfy a lot of these norms just because they don't feel quite strong enough to justify something that I would think of as like deserving a label democracy. Okay, um, so uh, two, I, I hear two questions in that, yeah. which is good. Um, so um, here's, here's the short answer on different epistemic norms, or different epistemic evidential standards, sorry. People who um, disagree, when there are disagreements about epistemic norms, or I'm sorry, evidentiary standards, let, let me speak about that particular. Um, people think there's a disagreement. There's not just a, you know, two ships passing in the night. They think that there is something to be said, right, about, right, what are the appropriate evidential standards in place here. And they think they can give each other reasons about that. They do it. Not only in philosophy either, by the way. Um, so it looks as if, well, why is it that we're able to see and diagnose and argue with 
people about their evidentiary standards, right? Well, because different views about the evidentiary standards that are appropriate are different views about what's appropriate in light of some shared epistemic norms, right? That's what I'm gonna, that's the sketch of the answer I'm gonna, I'm gonna give there. I don't think it's such a threat to my view that people are gonna have different senses of when the epistemic bar has been cleared for a particular class of belief. That's fine. They can, as long as they see themselves as having a disagreement about that, I think I'm in, in good, good shape there. Um, now, the, the issue about uh, the benevolent dictator or the, the, the epistemically virtuous consulting uh, authoritarian and these kinds of things, um, that is, uh, 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 that's, a, that's a problem. Versions of this paper, I try to say stuff about that. And um, what I'm going to say is sort of two kinds of things, right? Um, one is an almost Philip Pet kind of Philip Pettit kind of thought, right? You don't need the you don't need this epistemically virtuous dictator to be virtuous today. You need some way to ensure, right, that maybe counterfactually, because he'll never be corrupted, that were he to be corrupted, he can be held accountable, right? I'm going to try to run that kind of argument, right? That here's another way to put that thought. The epistemic dictator is virtuous for now, but if he were to become if he were to become vicious, I would be totally powerless. I think that's a violation of an epi that's epistemic trouble. Um, second thought is, if you're not going to buy that, that's fine. Second thought is, look, uh, I, 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 I do say this at the end of this paper. I am deeply attracted to the following thought, but I have not yet figured out the way to get there. I th I'm deeply attracted to the thought that this epistemic story, this first personal folk epistemic story, can go the whole distance. I think at some point, if you buy a certain, if you buy the epistemic story up to a point, and then are talking about, well, what about epistemically virtuous dictators? I'm going to say, look, okay, now I get to start talking about moral arguments, right? So I don't see the epistemic story as rivalrous to moral arguments about democracy. I think that if you've gotten far enough in the epistemic story to worry about the epistemically virtuous dictator, I've gotten enough of the epistemic story out that you're not going to object when I said, yeah, but look, there's a story to be told about autonomy and civility and reciprocity and all the rest that can be brought in to marshal other kinds of support for, the demo for, for democracy against this particular competitor. Now, last thought. I just really wonder what someone's thinking about when they're thinking about the epistemically virtuous dictator. I just, I'm just wondering what we're thinking about at that point. Um, the guy who has all of the virtues of a democratic system, except that he's a dictator, <laughs> right? That strikes me as the uh, Mary in the room who knows everything about seeing the color red, except having She's never seen one, you know, I'm just wondering. I've got a sort of Dan Dennett thought about certain kinds of thought experiments. It's like, the thought experiment counts on you not actually thinking about what you're supposed to really be imagining, right? So those are three different ways that I would go, but I would try to run them in concert. I just wanted to offer one quick follow-up. Perfect. Um, so it's just the thought that at the point, I, I, I sort of feel comfortable at the point where you have to bring in moral argument in favor of democracy, because at that point I sort of feel like my response can be, oh, okay, so we're not really, I mean, like, what you're saying is there's this epistemic requirement on any given political system, and maybe we're all going to agree that there are these epistemic norms that we want to play a role in any social life, but this is no longer a specifically epistemic account of democracy, it's just an epistemic account of, you know, sort of political life, and we should be responsive to ourselves as doxastic agents. Get, get, okay, I'm, I'm not unhappy with anything you said. Here's just, I would maybe put it a little bit differently and maybe push it a little bit further and say what this argument is supposed to try to suggest is that there are, there's a distinctive set of moral reasons for democracy, uh, epistemic reasons for democracy that might have force when the moral reasons have run out. That's real. That's the, the. That's by the way how I see the sustaining question. Right. It's like when the moral reasons are threatened, and any moral response to that threat is going to look question begging. There's this whole other brand we might say of normativity that can be now marshaled in support of a democratic society, and uh, that looks like it. It might not be such a bad idea to start 
making appeals to this assuming, uh, politically. Assuming you've considered all the social ontological bases for democracy, then that's the focus of this course, and completely different from moral, as you say, right. in my opinion. Uh, Sumer. Uh, hi, I'm Sumer. I'm sorry, can you say, tell me your name? Sumer. Okay. S U M R. So, I have many questions, but I reduced them to four, but all of them stem from one thing. When I was reading your paper, I always uh, pictured a particular root of a particular group of people in a particular type of democratic society, which is kind of white upper class, uh, white upper middle class male American citizen. So, when I think of this citizen, this argument makes sense to me, but other than that, I'm not sh I couldn't be sure how we can separate beliefs and epistemic norms from interests, power relations, emotions, as motives behind people's responses to any type of regime. And how can we attribute a uniform importance to all kinds of beliefs, given that their practical results are different? Like uh, if we compare a minority belief, which isn't really very much respected, and belief like uh, liberal capitalist norms that the middle class majority carries, and I assume challenging the latter would be more problematic for a democracy. Like, and other than that, I also think that um, why the question to why people do not start killing others, especially politicians, might not very much be related to epistemic epistemic process, but it is also about interests and what you can get out of uh, this process. You cannot just get away with it. You know that there is no chance of survival. So what I'm trying to say is that there is also, I think, a sort of calculation cost-benefit analysis involved. Good. So let me just say one quick thing about interests, um, which is a familiar thing, right, from Book One of the Republic, right? Um, uh, appeals to interests have an epistemic dimension to them because we think it's important to be right about what is in your interest, right? Um, so when we say, well, people aren't driven by reasons and the, the, the interest in getting truth, or they're, they're driven by interests, right? Well, they're driven by their interest as they think they've got them right, right? So when you say, look, you're, you're Think about the, uh, the what's the matter with Kansas phenomenon, right? Why are there so many people in Kansas who vote against their interests, right? Um, so, well, maybe it's because they're mistaken about their interests. So your interests are things that you can be right or wrong about. Would you admit that? Okay. And we think it's important to have true beliefs about what's in our interests. Just change it to preferences then. I think, I don't she think preference, she, she could, and I think I could raise this, I don't think preferences are transparent. I think that you can be wrong about your preferences. I think you can discover and correct your idea of what, not just come to have different preferences, but say, oh, I didn't prefer that at all. I just thought I did. So I, so I don't think that preferences or interests are transparent, and I think I, I, think I can argue that. Um, one thought, though, about the, uh, the first part of, of, of what you said, I think, is, is really important. Um, uh, if the account that I'm giving uh, has the flavor of a parochial, right, white guy academic who today happens to not be wearing a, tree, a tweed jacket but has lots of them in his closet, right, uh, all that's fine, but notice, right? Um, uh, I think one of the virtues of this kind of view is it makes sense of how it's possible from different standpoints to critique that perspective, right? That is, what we're getting from, right, um, uh, feminist, right, thinkers, what we're getting from uh, uh, um, uh, in, uh, international philosophers, right, um, uh, is a critique that says often, right, I'm going to, right, present a bunch of reasons to show why this particular moral theory, this particular philosophical view, this particular view of politics, right, is unwittingly mired in a very parochial perspective. That should count as a critique to the people who fit the description that you gave, 
right? Now, why would that be the case? Unless I, I'm trying not to be parochial and white and a guy with a tweed jacket, right? And I think that you can give me reasons that can show me that that's what my view is. I think, well, how is it possible for us to reason in this way? Unless, right, there's something that counts as you critiquing that kind of perspective that I have to recognize as a critique. That's how I would, that's how I would run that. that I, think I'm good, I think I've got good news for, your, for, for this kind of worry. I think. Uh, yeah. Rachel? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Hi. no. Um, so uh, you're just saying that you always have like stock examples that people bring up, so like religious authority. So my stock example is vaccine skeptics. Good. So I don't know if you've had this yet. So mm. um, the thing that I find really troubling about vaccine skeptics is that there's a lot of stuff a lot of critique of institutional epistemic norms that they pick up on that I think are genuine. So big pharma is unscrupulous and profit driven and has undue policy influence. The USDA and FDA are under regulatory capture. Lots of environmental risks are in the environment that we thought were innocuous, lead in the paint, stuff like that. Um, and I think it's also true that these sorts of facts um, undermine the trustworthiness of scientific and state regulatory institutions, right? Um, so I think they're pointing to genuine flaws in the institutional epistemic norms. Um, but we also don't think that in response to this, we should make those institutions more democratic, right? People shouldn't be able to opt out of vaccinating their kids. Well, at least I think. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I just, what I was reacting to was where you said that, that would be making it more democratic. Um, so you might think you get this like narrative of choice, like it's my choice to decide to do this or not to decide this, and you don't take that to be an epistem or you don't take that to be a, a democratic no. argument. No, no, I, 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 I wouldn't because I, I think that there are public goods, okay, uh, good. certain kinds of health goods, or good. certain kinds of public health concerns good. are public goods. Right. Just like you can't opt out the, of all kinds of other the things. The commons of the immunity. This is exactly yeah. right. So I'm, I, but. The anti-vax stuff is very interesting, precisely for the reasons that you you, you raised, and there are other kinds of less um, uh, less above board, but still epistemological sounding concerns, right? About well, it, it causes autism. Right? Jenny McCarthy it causes autism. I can show you, right? That there's a constant appeal to data. Right? Some of which is well-founded but doesn't get them the conclusion they want. Some of which is not well-founded and has been discredited and they're conveniently forgetting that by appealing to the corruption of the institutions. Right? Mm -hmm. But that's a full-on epistemic story that it looks like, I think the conclusions are nuts, right? And uh, are, it's a real menace, I think, uh, uh, socially. But um, uh, that, that's the form of argument that has to be presented for the end is, I think, good news for my story. They're trying to present, they often say, like, well, quacks of all kinds are often saying, I'm the one with the evidence, right? You say, well, it's not really evidence. Say, oh, no, no. Your conception of the evidence has been corrupted by the big pharma companies or the tobacco industry or whatever. It's like, there's a reason why conspiracy theories, for example, are so prevalent. It's like, they tap into something important about what our epistemic standards are and then exploit them, wittingly or unwittingly. So I think all that's good news for my view. It's bad news for society, makes democracy a much less, I'm sorry, a much more risky enterprise, I think. Um, that, <clears throat> let me just say one last thing about, that the idea of uh, individual choice, especially as it's wielded against any conception of social goods, mm -hmm. is presented as a democratic maneuver, mm -hmm. I think is also very telling and interesting from my point of view, right? Uh, from the point of view in this paper. That that denying of the social, in a way, mm -hmm. is understood or is has to be presented as the true democracy, I think is also Speaking interesting. Of which, let me let me just um, get in a sort of different kind of question, sure. which I'm sure has been asked previously. Um, but how do you get from these, um, and I really doubt that this is actually a social view at all, in the sense that it's got such a rigorously individualistic beginning. What, could you say a little bit more about your transition from these individualist norms to the social, socially epistemic norms? Sure. And 
In particular, it seems to presuppose that um, that our social um, understandings don't actually have a formative influence on these basic individualist norms. Okay. Are you committed to that? No. As so, an implication, and and how does that transition go? So let me let me say one very quick thing. So I think I. Um, uh, I don't think I have to deny um, any social ontological thesis that you, Carol, or or uh, are interested in. I think I can up. This is a what we might think of as a dialectical strategy. Not really. It's well, not dialectical enough because it's beginning from already the person formed with beliefs and uh, and good. And, this and, and so, but by dialectical strategy, I meant. Let me begin in a way that's not going to raise any red flags among somebody who is thoroughgoingly asocial in her ontology, in her epistemology, in her moral theory. Philosophy professors. That resonates with some of those Right. So let's just begin without having to have any strong social thesis on the, on the, on the table. I think later on I could bring it in and bring it in in a way that shows it's not just something that comes later in the story, it's something that was present at the beginning, it's just we weren't articulating it. So, uh, my, so my epistemology is social uh, through and through. The first personal epistemic norms, though, um, are where the argument begins simply because I think, maybe this is where you and I disagree, I think that the first personal epistemic norms are less contestable than any social ontological thesis we might begin with. Even if the social ontological theses that you favor are true, I think that somebody could say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm not only a methodological individualist, I am an atomist. I am, I am the anti-Charles Taylor of the world. I'm the atomist. <laughs> I don't believe any of this social ontology stuff. What do you say to me? I think I could say something to that guy. But then, you want your beliefs to be true, okay, don't you? But then the problem with going in that direction and uh, granting um, a social constructivist element to belief formation has the, uh, has the other effect of perhaps begging the question about democracy. Because if you, that would lead you into a kind of Habermasian line about the priority of a language in which there's a reciprocity of dialogue roles and there's a kind of fundamental inherent account, um, aspect of giving an account, so you've already got your third and fourth stages of the argument. I'm uh, not... Okay, ask you that. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with some overlaps with Habermas as long as it's not entire. I don't believe in inescapable presuppositions of discourse. Um, I do think that there were thoughts that didn't get picked up in the initial discourse ethics paper that should have been the focus of the subsequent work, and then he picked up things from, uh, from other angles uh, articulated in that paper. Um, again, what we want to say when we're doing philosophy, when we're trying to give uh, a philosophical theory, uh, uh, when we're trying to do political philosophy, um, I think is one thing that's going to be distinct from what I'm going to use this word again that, that you're not going to be happy with. This is a dialectical argument that's supposed to be able to speak to the guy who Person. isn't on, we'll see, that's exactly right, who isn't on board with any deep philosophical theory that we might be well justified in thinking <clears throat> is true about um, uh, our ultimate ontological interdependence. This is an attempt to say, given that you want your beliefs to be true, you want them to have the right, right connections to your evidence, you've got to go social about your epistemology and recognize your epistemic dependence on others. I think at the end of that story, we can, we can build a case for uh, interdependence of a social sort of a much broader kind, and I'm happy with that. I don't think you can start there to get at the problem I'm interested in, which is the Tea Party people. Jesse. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Jesse. Okay. Uh, and I guess I have just a worry about whether or not the extent to which 
this story will succeed at justifying, say, the preservation of maybe not even democracy, but even the open society institutions. Uh, and I guess my thinking, and the worries are from my thinking that it seems like you can't, you don't want to just pit these sort of epistemic norms against, say, moral norms, right? It seems like you want to say that the epistemic norms make moral norms self-defeating. So say that I'm like a, a animal liberation person, for example, and you're trying to say, oh no, you shouldn't try to destroy society because of what's happening to animals. Uh, it seems like, you know, you might say, look, because, because if you destroy society, then you lose all these epistemic norms. And I might say, well, okay, we just hit these two values against each other, you know, and the animals trump. Uh, and that seems like a lot of people who are very committed might say that, especially if, you're gone, if you've gone so far as to think that the moral norm that democracy is violating trumps whatever moral norms there are for democracy. Uh, and this seems especially true given the fact that it seems like maybe you could avoid even violating any epistemic norms, because I might just say, okay, well, I destroy the open society to save the animals, and then I'll just refrain from believing in the future. So then I'll just give up all my beliefs. So I won't even be violating epistemic norms. Um, so it seems to me like what you want to be saying is that to destroy, destroying these institutions actually undermines the very moral beliefs that would lead you to destroy the institutions in the first place. Uh, and that seems to me a very powerful argument, but I worry that you might not be able to get there because it's insofar as your argument is for the preservation of the open society, it seems like you're positing that the open society already exists and democracy already exists beforehand. So might, you know, then in that case I might say, say I'm the animal liberation person, I might say I you know, believe that we have to you know, save the animals, and I believe that it's true that we have to save the animals, and I believe that the evidence supports this and attracts the evidence, and that I've, want, you know, I've been able to engage with my peers because we've been in this open society. Uh, and, you know, I've been able to, to have all, all, you know, all the epistemic conditions seem to have been met. I've arrived at this belief, and then this belief justifies, you know, I think it is so strong, that it ju and what's going on is so horrible that it justifies me taking these actions. Uh, and so then it seems like, then I might say, yeah, maybe going forward I won't be able to have confidence in these beliefs, but it seems like this belief that I have right now is solid, uh, and that justifies, and you know, all of the sort of future issues, it just, this just trumps. Okay, so good, and there, there's a lot in there, right? So let me, yeah. let me try to um, uh, respond to a couple of, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to, to, to get it all in, but um, and I'm gonna leave, I'm, one of the things I'm not gonna talk about is just, the person who divests him or herself of all beliefs, right? And again, I just, I'm not sure what we're supposed to be thinking about with this sort of the guy who has done the Peronian thing and succeeded at it, right? Um, these are all arguments that presume that you have beliefs of some kind or other. So yes, um, that guy is gonna be a different kind of problem and uh, I've got other things to say. So the animal liberationist um, uh, surely thinks that um, if, um, Rebellion is what's called for in light of the important truth about animals that she has seen. Um, she's certainly going to be committed to the truth of her moral beliefs about the, not only the animals' understanding, but the importance of that belief relative to other moral values. Right? Um, she's not going to say, I take it, um, well, I've got this stance about animal liberation, but who knows if it's right. And she's not going to say, I take it. I have this stance about the importance of, uh, about animal liberation, but I don't know how, how, relative, how important it is relative to other kinds of things like social, social stability. Or the, okay, so she's going to be committed not only to a thesis about the need to liberate animals, but also the importance of that moral objective. Um, now, uh, what I think has to be raised... Let me introduce a distinction here and um, uh, see if this isn't helpful in some way. Um, because I think there is a way to run this kind of worry against the view that really does it damage, and then I just get to say, I don't think people can be like that. But um, let me run it with, with, with the, the, the less extreme version. So um, I think that uh, we need to keep in mind a distinction between sort of belief formation and belief uh, uh, maintenance. And when somebody says, as we might imagine the animal liberation is saying in your example, it's like, look, all this is great when you're looking for the truth. Right? These are great norms for finding out what's true. I've already found out what's true. I don't need these norms anymore. Now I just need society, right, to operate in a way that realizes this moral, or that accommodates this moral truth about animals, let's say. Um, you know, I, I think at this point you say sort of empirical things, right, about um, 
the ways in which um, our doxastic lives are unstable in ways that are not perceptible to us. So I'm thinking particularly of the group polarization phenomenon, right? Sort of, if you destroy the open society for the sake of, the, for the sake of preserving the truth, right, um, you'll lose the truth because Mill, it turns out, was right about the empirical stuff, right? About the dead dogma argument in that section of, of, uh, of On Liberty, right? If you believe that P and P is true and you've got all the reasons that show that P is true and you, for that reason, stop listening to people contest P. Mill thinks you'll lose the meaning of P. That might be true too. But one of the things that happens is your belief shifts to increasingly uh, uh, radical successors of P. This seems to be the case that you get a... Peter Singer, by the way, has a, has a nice passage about this, about going to a... Uh, uh, a conference about it, the environment. The first day of the conference, people are saying really sensible, you know, good progressive things about preserving the environment. By the third day of the conference, everybody is saying crazy things about preserving the environment. And the thought is, homogeneous doxastic groups tend to the uh, tend to cause believers to adopt increasingly extreme versions of the views that they had before they started talking amongst each other. So I think that, by the way, this works with religious believers too. I think that if you say, this is good stuff if you're looking for the truth, I've got the truth, so we don't need the latter anymore, kick it away. Say, so no, you need the open society norms in order to maintain your belief in the truth, because if you don't have the truth contested, you will imperceptibly to yourself come to adopt variants on the thing that you're now calling is true, or now saying is true. So that's the kind, again, I think there's a way to write it's like, but what about the really consistent guy? And yeah, I think that's a problem. Yeah. The last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said that nobody yet has said that if they find out that P is false, that they just stick with P. Well, I think it depends what P is, right? Um, and I'm thinking about this in relation to your idea of sustained democracy, because when there are uh, failures of a particular system, uh, what do people do who believe P? They don't say, well, P is false. They say, My, our conception of this system was mistaken. And so, you know, we go in a different direction, but still, uh, well, they take a different tack, but with the same direction. And so I think that if you think about different political systems, like, or different uh, political uh, outlooks like socialism or democracy or conservatism, uh, people change what the content of of the uh, the view is over time. Uh, when there are successful uh, problems are shown with you know particular theories or you know the system doesn't work out. Yeah, could I just hook on to that and then you could address both? Yeah. I mean, the, the Kuhnian um, line would seem to fit into this, where, you know, uh, if we um, want to defend a Ptolemaic system, if it's shown to be false, we'll just invent some more epicycles um, to account for the particular um, uh, the gaps in the theory. Um, so I don't see why um, it's not quite the same, but isn't that a, a tendency as well, which is in some way responsive to evidence, but it's just to further defend your belief system in the context of the overall background that you have. So, um, uh, I think, in response to, to both of these thoughts, right, that I can get enough of what I want to say as long as we're talking about um, the need to revise in light of recalcitrant evidence. And, well, there's a way to deal with that. You just throw on some more epicycles, or you introduce some new kind of stuff, right? I think that the Kuhnian story, right, good. I think that the Kuhnian story is, at least one point in which he tells it, a story about saying, there is something that will count as disconfirming or recalcitrant evidence that needs to be addressed. The question now is, how do you address it? You don't always have to give up the theory. You can revise the theory. You can revise your conception of what the recalcitrance is. Right? But what drives, why not just say, oh, who cares? Because you want the theory to 
capture something that you're saying it's not captured, right? Why not say, oh, it didn't work, so what? Because you want, because there's some appeal to working or success that you are pointing to, in light of which, right? You even said it several times, in this, we, it was mistaken. It needs to be corrected. I think all that stuff um, helps my view, right? Not necessarily, because you had all that. It, to some degree, it implies the requirement of free and open communication among the community of scientists. Uh, which is sort of analogous to a democratic uh, community, but it doesn't yet get you to the democratic community because you had all those great scientists who were operating without democracy. There was a certain analogy of accountability, but it didn't involve the crucial element of equality of persons. Right. So, and I think everyone that everyone in a given community and that kind of thing. So, how are you going to get that from the view? So. That's the latter part of the of the story. That's that third yeah, group of democratic norms. I think there are also issues from the standpoint of theory change that are analogous and problematic also the way he was pushing because it requires yet a new theory according to the Kuhnian line to come along to reframe the conversation if the interest is true. But anyway, um, but let me just hear what you say about um, uh, your last part. Of okay, yeah, so... Um, I think that um, the way that equality, uh, again, and I'm not trying to say that the epistemic argument renders or puts out of business any moral concerns about democracy. I'm not saying that all the really important values of democracy are epistemic ones, and I'm not saying that the epistemic values are rivalrous or uh, are competitors to moral accounts. I'm not even saying that as democratic citizens, the epistemic values should be our reasons for being Democrats. You can say, look, I've got more reasons to be a Democrat, and the epistemic stuff isn't really motivating me. I think I can agree to all of that. The way that I think that equality can come in, in the epistemic sense at least, uh, is to say, look, from the very, from, with the social epistemic dialectical norms, if people don't have, some people don't have the standing to raise objections to P. Say, well, I believe that P, but the people who might disagree with me have been cowered into silence because of their socially weak position. I think that is also a violation of them. That looks like the norm has given us reason to think that the second and third first personal norms haven't been satisfied. You haven't had access to the full range of evidence if some people, due to social inequality or vulnerability, aren't allowed to speak and raise the objections. And one more thing, you should, would, wouldn't you be committed to global democracy then, on your view? Because yeah, well, in a sense, the, yes. Objections could come from anywhere. Yeah, in a sense, yes. That's an interesting, that's certainly an innovative uh, justification of global democracy. <laughs> Nobody has ever given that one, I think. Okay, very good. Let's uh, join me in Thank you. Me.